Pierce, you want to kick us off? Cool. Yes, uh, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, joining in today. Uh, my name is Pierce Clark with XR Association. I am a white male. And uh, we're meeting today to discuss um, audio cues um, in 2D games and apps and identifying practices that we can apply to make audio cues in extended reality um, even better. So a little about XR Association. Uh, we are a trade association focused on the responsible deployment of extended reality technologies, uh, which include virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, mixed reality, um, and the kind of caveat at the end is all future technologies yet to be invented because this is a pretty fast moving industry. Um, and at XRA, we work with a number of subject matter experts and cover a wide variety of topics, including um, education and health and inclusion. Uh, we look at technology standards and accessibility. Um, audio cues and extended reality came up as a topic of discussion uh, during a recent accessibility workshop and plays a major role, I think we can agree, in really um, all 2D and um, immersive experiences. Um, so we're hosting this session to dive into the area and explore how we can um, leverage audio cues um, to improve the experience for those who are blind or have low vision. Uh, we're partnering with XR Access to host this session. Um, and XR Access is doing a lot of terrific work in the space. Uh, so together we have organized this event. Um, we're joined by three guest speakers, um, Saqib from Microsoft, uh, Tim from Cognition, and Robert from Microsoft. But I'll let each of them kind of introduce themselves in a moment. Um, this, the intent of this session is to be really collaborative. We wanna hear from as many people as we can and understand as much as we can out of the 90 minutes that we have today. Um, and before we dive into hearing from our um, guest speakers and then a conversation afterwards, um, I'd like to pass it off to Dylan with XR Access to introduce himself. Yes, thanks, Pierce. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dylan Fox. I'm the head of community and outreach uh, at XR Access. Um, if you haven't heard of us, we are a nonprofit organization uh, based out of Cornell Tech focused on making immersive technologies accessible to everybody, regardless of ability. Um, and yeah, we're really excited about this, this conversation today because audio cues, um, particularly audio cues in these virtual 3D environments, is something that's really not, I think, well understood at this point. There isn't a, here's your big list of best practices. Uh, there isn't kind of an accepted gold standard yet. Um, it's really in an exploratory state. Uh, and so what we hope to do today, basically, is to bring... Uh, a bunch of folks together. We we got our our great uh, guest speakers here to kind of kick things off and queue up some some things for conversation. But um, after that, we really wanted to have just an hour of you know the the smartest folks we could find that have expertise on this type of thing. That's that's you all uh, to to try to parse out what are the best practices, uh, what are the the barriers to making them happen, um, and how can we. Uh, use audio to make virtual and augmented reality a more accessible tool uh, for people who rely on audio um, to to you know interact with these things. Um, so just a few uh, pieces of business before we go on. I have a Google Doc that we've set up for today. Um, I've just posted that in chat, and that includes uh, a description of this event, um, some resources, and uh, as well as a list of participants for anybody who wants to, to stay in touch after this um, and some discussion topics and notes. So uh, if at any point you want to add um, a potential discussion topic uh, to that to that document, uh, please do so and we'll make sure that we get to those um, during the, the main conversation. Um, similarly, if you want to add an example of something, if there's a product you worked on that you think would be a good point of reference for the people here, um, please go ahead and add it to that because we we really want this to be a jumping off point for creating and sharing something that will be helpful to people in this industry moving forward. So yeah, I think that's about it. We're going to have each of our speakers talk for 10 minutes or so, and then we'll have the rest of the time for discussion. So with that, uh, Saqib, please take it away. Hi, just confirming I'm audible. Yep. Awesome. So hi, I'm Sakib Sheikh from Microsoft. I work on solutions to empower people with disabilities um, using emerging technologies like AI and AR. Well, XR, I should say. In particular, I've 
I'm blind myself. And that led me down the path of creating the Seeing AI iPhone app. This is really taking a bunch of the emerging work of Microsoft on artificial intelligence to understand the world around you for someone who's blind. You hold up your phone and it starts reading to you, recognizing the people around you, and in general, describing the scene. That's something we've been doing for quite some time and indeed continue to push the envelope on. But more recently, also been looking at how do we create audio augmented reality experiences? And it's AR because it's an app which people are using to understand the real world. But many of the ideas would apply equally to virtual reality or even gaming. So I'm really excited to be talking to this group and to have that discussion later on because the expertise in audio is really the key here. How do we create immersive audio experiences that complement the audio from the real world or even replace it and convey as much information in the case of my work to someone who's blind? I mentioned gaming. And actually, it's interesting to think that's where a lot of my original inspiration for our XR work came from. Going back 20 years, you had Shades of Doom, which was the first 3D audio game I'd ever come across. This idea that the kind of cues that a, someone who's blind would rely on could be presented through a stereo soundscape, and that you could simulate 3D space in sound through 2D headphones. And that's kind of commonplace now, but you know, this is 20 years ago, whether it is the direction of the wind, the echo of your footsteps, um, or the direction that the sound of an object is coming from. This really meant that, you know, in that case, you're just using the cursor keys to navigate in a game. But as you turn, as you walk, you can tell you're getting closer to a wall, you can, from the echo, you can tell that there's something occluding another sound like a wall because it gets fainter. And it's just quite remarkable, this idea of audio augmented reality where you have the sounds around you complementing the sounds that you can actually hear in the real world. So, you know, in terms of the games, Papa Sangre was another game that inspired me much later on. That's probably 2010-ish, 10, 2011. Um, that was on an iPhone and started making use of the sensors in the iPhone so you can turn it. And you're again, you're getting a very, very rich 3D audio experience through normal headphones. So then my work on seeing AI, I told you, you hold up the phone and it recognizes text people and things around you. So we started working with the LiDAR on the iPhone to detect how far away things are. So we're building up a 3D model of the world. You can tell that there's a chair over there, a table over there. As you pan, every time it detects an object from the vision, from the visual input, from the camera, and it knows whereabouts in 3D space it is from LiDAR, we can now present that with spatial audio. So you'll actually hear objects being announced. So part of audio cues is spatialized speech. So we can make it sound like the speech comes from the chair. The word chair comes from the chair. We have sort of three modes. There's what's right ahead of me. So as you point the camera, it's going to say chair. But well, that's less interesting because it's always going to be in front of you in terms of spatialness. But after you've seen things and it's got this 3D model, you can then have a scan and it will describe all the things around you and you'll hear them further away or closer, left, right, forward, back in that, in your headphones. You can also, the third mode of interaction we um, developed is placing beacons on things. So you could place a beacon on a door and as you move towards it, you can use the sound to center yourself and to walk through the door. But we're sort of expanding this, that those, this concept of a beacon, what if you place beacons on moving things that you want to follow or avoid? What if you could place these beacons along a path to follow? 
and much more. So that's the work in seeing AI, and I can go to much more detail later. We're also working on head tracking. So with headphones like the AirPods, which support spatial audio, you can you don't need to be looking where the camera is looking. And that's something that another product from Microsoft Soundscape makes great use of. It's a separate app focused on creating soundscapes when you're walking outdoors. Using GPS, it will announce the intersections and the buildings around you. You'll hear as you're walking which roads are on the left, which buildings are on the left or the right. And it really creates this immersive experience that augments your awareness as you're walking around. So once again, this is placing audio cues into the real world. One of the other interesting areas that we haven't released any products in, but sort of is actively worked on at Microsoft in VR in general and some of our ga gaming work that Rob will talk about later is, okay, this is 3D cues using spatial audio coming from objects in the real world. But you can really see that this is in many ways much easier. If you had the rich metadata, like an accessibility object model, but if the rich metadata about a virtual world, all of these things would transfer across in to allow you to have that rich immersive audio soundscape in VR as well. So I'm gonna pause here, I think. I, I could say so much more, but I'm gonna leave that for our discussion later on. Great. Thank you so much Thank for you. sharing your work. Um, that's, that's, that's just, I mean, flat out cool. I mean, how, how we can complement the audio in the real world or uh, replace it digitally is um, so important. And spatial audio yeah, really does give the important grounding to give users the impression that they're in the real world, but it can also cue blind users into where they are. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing some of the different mechanisms that, you, that, that you're working on. Uh, they're all gonna be used in some capacity uh, in this uh, ultimate sort of vision for the future. Um, and some of the new technologies, including LIDAR, are surely going to be ingrained in any um, final product that we can roll into immersive, tech, uh, immersive experiences. Um, and speaking of new technologies, I, I'd love now to pass it off to Tim, um, who is with Cognition. Uh, Tim, take it away. Thank you, Pierce. So yeah, I'm just going to give an intro. Um, so I'm Tim Stutz, uh, current director of product design at Cognition. Um, we are a neurotech augmented reality startup working on head mounted display plus non invasive brain computer interface. Um, I will get back to you on the work I'm doing there, but I want to work chronologically through some examples in my career where audio, extended reality, and assisted technology have all intersected. So, um, one of the things like that's interesting about my background is as I, I started out in audio and sound design and I worked my way into uh, interaction design and effectively then assisted reality, augmented reality. I saw I have that I have that skill, that experience in my back pocket and I, I use it in different ways. My my original um, work in sound design was doing sound design for games and some of the speakers are, are mentioning games so i worked on uh, jade empire and unreal championship 2 for xbox um, and at the time though i had um i had really no exposure to assisted tech or extended reality which is kind of in its heyday i guess there were at the time in the early 2000s there were some vr experiments out there um but yeah, I, I got I, I got that skill and I kind of just tucked it away in my back pocket. And in the years that follow, I actually shifted to work more on uh, interaction design projects. Um, and my audio knowledge is something that I would like bring in to different projects. Sometimes like a, an interactive project I was working on would would need sound design. So it would be I would have created like a prototype uh, done in interaction design and then like you know how things go with audio in the final two weeks we would need sound effects and so i would iterate on those and design those uh for a project um and then other times um i was involved in more of a consulting capacity so i'll get into my work with with magic leap and kind of explain that and then that segues nicely i think into the, the accessibility 
which that was the first time where I was exposed to it uh, at Magic Leap. So yeah, at Magic Leap, um, I was on a team of interaction designers working on the operating system um, in the early days. And uh, I um, we, we were working with Skywalker Sound on, on sound design for applications. Uh, they're a pretty high, high profile studio. Uh, ben Burt is one of the sound designers working there and they've done sound design for Star Wars and WALL-E and a slew of other uh, films. And um, yeah, I, at the time, given my background in interaction design, but also being the person on the team with the most audio background, I, I was overseeing a lot of the um, the sound design effort for the, uh, the OS. So um, working with our partners and uh, kind of making sure things worked. And one of the things like I started to learn even at that early phase was um, like the importance of things like uh, spatial audio. And um, also the importance of just audio as like uh, like some kind of cue, like whether whether it's like a notification, um, and especially audio for something that is outside of a user's FOV, which would cause them to 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 rotate around. Uh, really nice discoveries. Um, at Magic Leap, um, I also was vice chair of the Leapable group. It was a, a an, internal employee resource group uh, for accessibility, but also um, we did some community outreach efforts. And finally, um, we, we brokered some uh, more accessible features in the project, um, the product release for Magic Leap One. So I oversee uh, uh, the design of Bluetooth keyboard implementation, for instance, in our, our operating system and making sure that device uh, worked as um, input. Um, yeah, and so moving forward, I um, I had a, a, a great experience working at Euphoria on the other side, like where, whereas before I was at Magic Leap working on the device itself in Euphoria, uh, Magic Leap was basically one of the platforms we were building an app for. And there, um, because the team was even smaller, then I was back. I found myself in the role of like an interaction designer, but also sound designer. So in the past year, I got to do um, sound design for uh, Magic Leap apps and HoloLens, app, HoloLens apps and like just kind of got in there. And, and it had been a while since I'd done some actual sound design work on a project. And um, yeah, one of the things I discovered about the unique space that we were working in is um, the products we're working on were geared towards work instructions in the factory. So in the factory, you would deal with situations like loud sounds. You'd have situations where there was blinding light or no light or poor Wi-Fi, or you're, you would have like a user would have to wear gloves to hold an object, or one hand was tied while the other one needed to do something, and our augmented reality apps would let them operate in this kind of hands-free way where they would move between different steps in a procedure or capture spatial markers in a factory setting. And there was a massive parallel there. Like our initial goal wasn't really focused around accessibility, but one thing I learned over that year is that um, some of the challenges that workers face in the factory are many of the same challenges that that users would face in the outside world, some of the some of the mobility, um, some of the mobility issues and and issues with sound and lighting were things that we uh, we we were tackling in our apps essentially. So that was really interesting uh, parallel. And um, after Euphoria, I went to Cognition. I'm I'm there now as their director of design and. I'm excited to say that this is the first time where I've seen like there in my work, there's like a real direct intersection with assisted technology, augmented reality. Um, and we're building a um, wearable um, brain computer interface, augmented reality display. Uh, and the, the customer are, are uh, users with disabilities. Uh, cerebral palsy for one. And so we're dealing with um, users who have, um, who are neurotypical, but have um, unique motor disabilities and challenges that um, 
might make it difficult to to move a hand and and use it as a uh, like use it in the way um, some of us would use like on an iPad, for instance. And so we're leveraging head pose quite a bit for interactions. Uh, and uh, moving forward, we're also looking at DCI uh, as as a path where we're looking at that now actually. And with the idea that um, users with even more severe disabilities, um, like uh, advanced stage ALS, where um, neurotypically are fully there, uh, but but then have no um, ability to move their body at all, let alone control their eyes, uh, we can we can show them images on a display, and and you and use like a feedback mechanism to gauge like their input. Like yes or no, option A, B, or C. So really excited. Um, I know that was a long intro, but um, that's kind of the arc of my my career and where I'm in now and my interest related to audio. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tim. Uh, and now let's go ahead and pass it over to Robert, um, who's done some absolutely amazing work with uh, spatial sound and audio at Microsoft. Uh, Robert, take it away. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, my name is Robert Riddahall. I am a technical audio specialist in the advanced technology group at uh, Xbox and Microsoft. I'm a long time audio guy in the games industry. I uh, started my career actually over 30 years ago. Um, and what I have been uh, what I love about where we are today is that we now have um, a whole slew of technologies that are just amazing that allow us as, as audio designers and uh, creators and programmers to really bring um, virtual worlds to life. So, you know, when we're, when we talk about experiences for um, gamers without sight or folks who are blind or low vision, uh, there are, there's a whole set of technologies that um, help us to paint a picture of the virtual world, you know, whether it's a gaming world on a flat screen, um, a VR, uh, or even AR, um, you know, though I, I think, and I'll, I'm really interested in, in um, hearing folks what they have to say in, in this conversation about um, augmented reality specifically, because in that case, we're trying to uh, augment and uh, add to the real world. Um, and so in some ways, we have to be a lot more accurate about our, our virtual representations. Um, but so I, I think about what I wanna talk about here is just the uh, technologies for audio at, at sort of a, a high level. And um, I break these down into uh, a number of different pillars. Um, the first one, and we're all familiar with, is spatial, spatial sound, spatial audio. Uh, the way that I think about spatial sound is that this is the technology that allows um, us as designers to accurately give location information about the sound in a in a virtual world. Um, it's, we now have a, a lot of different ways to uh, render spatially. Um, there are technologies in the, in the home theater uh, for, for gaming that allow for people to have um, speakers either above them or sounds reflected uh, off the, the ceiling um, that give a much deeper immersive sense of space um, with the spatial sound. And then there's headphone rendering, which I think is probably the, the most important thing that we should be talking about in this, this converse, uh, conversation here as most of these platforms um, will be using some sort of technology in, in headphones. And you know, so for spatial sound, spatial sound is done through head relative transform functions uh, over, over headphones to um, virtualize locations um, of sound over two speakers in your, your ears, right? And one of the things that I, I want to make sure that we also are aware of when we talk about HRTF is that uh, we, 
it, it's very dependent on how you hear HRTF processing is very dependent on um, the shape of your ears, the size of your head, uh, how far your shoulders are from your from your ears. And so HRTF processing, it, it doesn't work the same for everybody. And while we have, there, there's a whole lot of different um, companies that have different uh, rendering uh, technologies. When we think about it in gaming, anyway, in the way that I've been speaking to, um, uh, to spatial sound over headphones is that we have to understand this for our end users and that um, if we give options for, for them in terms of the different, different kinds of rendering, uh, it's more likely that they will, that a user will have a better experience over headphones. Um, so that's a, a little bit of a, a soapbox for me, but I, I think it's something that we really should be aware of um, when we're thinking about our consumers of our technologies and, uh, and our experiences, that not everybody's gonna have the same experience. Um, you know, and spatial sound uh, as, as a technology is um, is just again, it's one component. It gives that location information. Um, another pillar is what I uh, is in the area of acoustics. So um, the way I describe acoustics, as many of you I'm sure know, acoustics is ha uh, describes how sound propagates through a world. Um, you know, is sound coming through a doorway behind me? Um, is it behind a giant rock uh, up in, in front of me? And there's all sorts of ways to represent um, acoustics in, in a virtual world. Um, there's uh, other components that come with acoustics are um, early reflections, that, that first sound that bounces off of a, a nearby uh, object. Um, there's the reverberation is a component of acoustics, like giving you a sense of how big a space is, uh, how echoey um, it is, uh, how reflective or, or um, uh, absorptive is the area around you. Um, and we have these technologies today to, to really highly accurately represent acoustics. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to keep this, this conversation a, a generalized um, um, conversation on, on these technologies, but I will point out one uh, acoustics technology is called Project Acoustics, and it, it came out of um, Microsoft uh, research. Um, there's a link for it in, in that document, and it's, uh, it's a technology that we've been um, putting into games uh, at Xbox. It's, uh, it's a highly accurate representation of the, of the world. Um, in that it, it isn't just a designer going in and deciding, oh, this room is um, so it's going to be uh, this kind of reverberation. It actually accurately um, does a wave uh, transformation of how that space would, would sound with acoustics. Um, so spatial sound is locations of sounds. Acoustics is how those sounds propagate through the world. These are two you know, large pillars in the technologies that we should be thinking about and using in our designing for, for virtual worlds. And not only do they give us the ability to, to paint a picture of, of, the, of the world. So if I can close my eyes and I can hear the space, I can hear the locations of those sounds, um, I'm, I'm giving somebody who is blind or low vision uh, a really nice picture of the world, and I'm also making it more immersive for everybody. So that's spatial sound and acoustics. Um, there's a couple of other technologies that, that I think that we should discuss and talk about, uh, especially when it comes to um, gamers without sight or blind and low vision um, users. Uh, one is, uh, synthesized voice, text-to-speech. Um, the, the most basic usage of, of TTS is for screen readers. You know, your Windows machine can uh, 
can speak to you and, and uh, read you off all the, the text on a screen in games. We do screen readers for UI. The TTS has so much more potential in, uh, in virtual worlds and in gaming to help describe the world. Um, and then I think the, the, the last piece that um, I wanted to sort of talk about is that none of those pieces really um, cover is I can paint a picture of the world with acoustics and spatial sound. I can uh, do a screen reader with TTS, but being able to navigate through an, um, a virtual world becomes um, that it's not enough, you know, to hear where a sound is and um, how the, the space is, is great. It gives us a lot, but um, I think Saqib talked a little bit about beaconing, being able to cues that, that give you um, information about where a location is that you're trying to get to. Um, so beaconing is, is something that I think is super important when we think, think about these, uh, these experiences. Um, text-to-speech callouts, using text-to-speech to describe specific things in the world. There's you know, a chair, um, there's a, or in a virtual world, there's a windmill off to the left. Those, uh, this is another place where TTS becomes uh, very important. Um, and then one other aspect that I think comes in trying to give information about navigating in a virtual world is the ability to know if my path is blocked in front of me. So how do we do that, that kind of thing? We can kind of do it with um, acoustics, but I think that there's opportunities to do more than that. Uh, to understand where, uh, if I'm being blocked by, by an object. And I want to point to you, there's uh, in that, that document again is a link to another um, app and technology that came out of Microsoft Research called Microsoft Soundscape. You may be familiar with this. Um, those things that I just talked about are um, ideas that come from this. Soundscape is an app that lets folks use GPS on their phone in the real world to help them guide um, and navigate the real world using things like beacons and um, speech callouts and, and other things. So um, one last thing, and then I'll, I think we should, uh, I'm really, um, really looking forward to an open conversation here is, uh, Tim was talking about haptics. Um, I think haptics is a really important area that, that we should be thinking about and, and something that has not been really pushed on. Um, adding in haptics, uh, especially for your hands, which are super sensitive to, to different uh, vibrations. There's with the um, hardware and different kinds of uh, tools that we have with uh, these different platforms. I think there's a lot we can do with haptics to enhance um, those things that we can bring with audio. I think of haptics almost as the other side of the coin of, of audio. They, they, they work in the same kind of space of frequency and intensity, and uh, um, we are very sensitive to, to those. So anyway, I ramble, um, my apologies, um, but I, I, I wanted to really just get all of the, these ideas out, uh, these, um, technologies that we have today that are available on all of our, our different platforms, whether it's for gaming, VR, AR, and um, similar to, there's, there's a number of companies out there that, uh, that have similar technologies. It's not just Microsoft. So with that, I think maybe we should um, move to a, an open conversation. Yes, perfect. Um, thank you, Robert and everyone for um, sharing your careers, your input into this industry and some of the topics you're exploring. Um, it's it's uh, great to hear that there are so many great minds working on bringing virtual worlds to life. And I'm um, 
And I'm really encouraged that there will be, um, you know, a future filled with deep and immersive virtual experiences. So yes, absolutely. Let's um, um, open up the conversation to, uh, for everyone. Uh, feel free to drop a comment in the questions. Um, and we can start working our way down some of the topics that have uh, been brought up or uh, jotted down in the uh, Google Doc that's been circulating around. So I think we can probably start with, uh, so we had a, a question to Saqib and also to the general public here. Um, for the idea of placing a beacon on a moving object, is that a physical device that goes on the moving object or can that be assigned through another means to identify the moving object? And yeah, I'd love to, to hear about kind of folks' ideas on, on beacons and tracking things in particular for uh, as well. I think going back to audio games as a good example, uh, Swamp has a good example of using beacons in multiple ways for tracking objects and tracking uh, other uh, NPCs and tracking uh, other people in space. And so they use um, uh, multiple audio beacons for tracking each one of those different things. But um, it depends what we're talking about beacon here. If we're talking about an auditory icon, which is more representative of the character, or if we're talking about an ear con, which is a beep or some sort of uh, musical cue uh, representative of the same uh, information. And so um, I think a lot of research has shown that auditory icons, which are more representative, like footsteps, for example, are more effective than just like a beep. Uh, and so both those could be considered beacons. We had, in, when I was working at Euphoria, we ran into an interesting um, situation where, and this is one that people encounter working on like AR head mounted displays encounter all the time. Like in most cases, your menu system is either anchored to your field of view in some way, whether that it's with like a loose tag along where it like drifts a little bit, or it's it's basically like essentially uh, pinned in the landscape or pinned in the real world. And so our users, um, they needed both capabilities and, but what would happen like <laughs> as a result of moving away from a menu so that it would be targetable from a distance because you had to, like in addition to having direct touch, like being able to reach out and touch a button with your finger, like from a distance you could hand cast, uh, which is like basically a, a way of, of pointing your hand palm at an object, generating an array, and then, and then bringing your thumb and index together. In order to do that from a distance, the menu would have to grow. And so our, our menu, uh, would do that. It would grow, and to grow, it needed um, it needed a sound, and so we created one that was um, kind of well, it's like a pitch up, like kind of sound, and then when it would grow down, it would be like, Ooh. and um, that worked pretty well. And one of the things that's really interesting, and why I bring this up in the context of moving objects. Um, so the menu would be stuck in in the landscape, but the user would be moving away from it. And at some point, we decided to sonify the menu growing, even if the user what didn't have the menu in its FOV, because otherwise it might be shocking if they look back and the menu was in the process of growing or much bigger to increase targetability. So yeah, it's kind of like um, this question of like a tree, I guess they're like a tree falls in the for us and no one's around, <laughs> you know, that kind of whole thing. It's like, can, is there a world where we do that in our UI for the things that aren't seen and maybe even the things um, that, th th like it, things that are purely anticipating um, kind of like a, like a, a future interaction state of, of an object. So one, one thing that's interesting about, um, Beaconing, I think, is because people are asking about the, the design of it. And uh, Tim, I like what you were just talking about. Um, I'll give an example in the, the Soundscape app. And in, in Soundscape, uh, anybody can try out Soundscape uh, app. I think you can just go to the, uh, the store and try it out. But the beacon that is used in Soundscape has um, multiple layers. 
And so the beacon actually changes its, um, its texture based on your orientation towards the beacon. So you, if it's behind you, it's kind of a little, just a bit, a bit of a thump when you, as you rotate towards and your, your orientation is now in 15 degrees or so directly at the, the location of that beacon, you get a nice ping and a pattern to it. Um, from my perspective in, as an audio designer, uh, I think that um, you know, frequency and rhythm are two of the things that we really um, can tie into. Um, that being said, uh, like in the gaming world, um, I wouldn't expect necessarily that I would want to have a, an, a an ear con, as it were, like that would be the same from game to game to game. Oh, um, Gears of War, for example, has um, in, in one of their modes has a, a beaconing system, but the design is designed to fit within the the game world. The there's the 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 audio universe, as it were, for 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 Gears has a very specific sound to it. So I think it's going to be. It, that kind of design will really vary from experience to experience, whether it's VR gaming or. or uh, Robert, one of the things you mentioned was um, it's, it's interesting is that like the properties of the sound would change, like depending on your distance or angle from it. And I mean, that, that happens like that phenomenon is like related to acoustics and frequencies hitting the ear, but it sounds like you're actually going a step further and designing experiences in such a way where the rhythmic properties of the sound would would change uh, and other maybe other properties just simply based on perspective. And I find that that really interesting. And I think um, in, in the game space, some of these games, if you exaggerate that too much, you're and you're in it, it's taking place in like a real world environment, like you're in like a battle scene of World War II, those things might start to to throw people off because they no, you no longer have this kind of cinematic reality but if you're in 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 a game world where you're in an alternate dimension or it's kind of just implied that physics are out the window you might be able to do that get away with that more but i'm curious if you've had any success d doing using these techniques in games where that, that were close to real world experiences and having them be seamless and like where the user, the, the user can tell that they're effective, but doesn't question, but really doesn't question like, Hey, would it actually work like that? Because it's so seamless. Yeah. It's uh, it really is so bespoke from experience to experience. Um, I don't have a, a, a lot of, um, AR experience, like if we're, I would think that we would use more of, um, an, uh, I like the word ear con, but a, a very distinct um, sound um, rather than trying to um, design for the real world uh, in, in that case. I don't know, it, it's, um, it's, I think it's a, a little, it's uh, hard to answer that, um, and, except for the that we do know that the kinds of um, aspects of sound that that we attune to uh, really uh, in our in our ears. Um, I, I'll just give give an example with spatial sound. One of the best practices that we talk about with spatial sound is that high frequency sounds localize better. Low frequency sounds spread out. So if you want to give pinpoint information on a, um, if you want somebody to perceive a sound in a more of a pinpoint location, use a high frequency sound. That, I don't know if that's answering your question, but it's um, another thing that comes to mind as, as we talk about, uh, about these things. But, um, you know, rhythm is super important. But we as human beings the, the, uh, are very uh, attuned to, to different, um, patterns and um, we pick up on those and we remember them um, even more like you could be tone deaf right you, you that that term but you're 
we we all have a, a sense of rhythm. We might not be able to recreate that rhythm, but um, in, in terms of how we uh, we perceive, perceive things. Um, but it's, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I wonder if there's um, any, any folks on the call who have experience in, in, in trying things like this. Um, I just pasted a paper in the Google Doc discussing that, that uh, evaluated ear cons, auditory eye cons, ear cons, and the different types of uh, sound um, features that you can put in uh, together and kind of evaluated like which one was most effective in which situation. Um, so it's there's been a lot of research on this topic. Yeah, I think that the the other thing, sorry, the, the other thing about uh, ear cons um, and uh, these sets of sounds is that for for a given type of experience, I mean, consistency can is something that is good uh, as well. We want to know, uh, like there's, I know that um, my, I got a text message on my phone because I have a particular ear con that I have used and I always, um, I, I got used to that. And, and now um, every time I, I hear that, I was like, oh no, I know that's a, that's a text message. Um, you know, in, for example, in Windows, the, the UI sounds, they're consistent, I think, um, and they're consistent across all of your, your different um, experiences in the operating system. So you know that this particular beep is, is that, and this, uh, so I think that's another important aspect of, of ear cons is. Um, I wonder, I, maybe, and maybe the paper kind of might go in a disclaim, I, I just kind of skimmed it, but it seems like a strong case to be made for altering rhythm over timbre in terms of um, sonifying a beacon spatially is that um, from an accessibility perspective, my thought is perhaps mo most more people can, can discern a rhythm than they can discern timbral differences. I think sound. that's... I, that's a great point. And the other thing that the the uh, the rhythmic pattern will uh, you'll be able to pick up in, in unlike a um, you know, particular like it's if it's a bing or something like that. In a lot of these experiences, they're so dynamic in their audio. And it's one of the things I love about games, as opposed to saying doing sound design for a, a movie where it's. A movie is a, is a linear experience. It's going to be the same sound every time. In games, it's constantly changing, and it's it's a challenge that we have as as designers and mixers to be able to make that for any given set of circumstances going on, that what is important to the listener, the the gamer at that moment in that game comes across. And I would say that exactly what you just said, Tim. Um, rhythm is something that I think would be something that we could pick out against all of that just noise, as it were, um, and the variability of that is happening with all the sound around uh, internet experience. Uh, bringing in some so, questions from the chat really quick. Um, we had a good conversation about the um, the frequency ranges. And I'd like to ask this and, and bring this up to the crew. Um, how would you recommend um, avoiding a, you know, uh, a very, very noisy scenario where there's different tones and different frequencies and, you know, maybe conflicting beacons. So as not overload the user, should there be, and, I, and I, I'd add on to that, um, should there be some uh, sort of baseline uh, system uh, supported sounds? Um, or should it be app dependent? Well, there should be sensible defaults, but users should be able to toggle on and off which types of sounds they're hearing. So for example, uh, going back to Swamp again, you can adjust the volume of whichever types of beacons you want to hear, you know, whether it's the world sounds um, or other players' footsteps or your footsteps or you know, all kinds of stuff. You can you can adjust the volume of each one of those things individually, and that's a very useful feature to have. And 
uh, it can really you know help um, reduce the amount of auditory clutter. But there are people uh, who very much appreciate that auditory clutter and and um, you know or a busy interface, and so they want to be able to have all of it. I think that's a great that's a, a great point um, uh, too. It's one of the um, the Microsoft has their um, accessibility guidelines. Um, I had meant to put that link into into the document. Um, I think we can we can do that. But giving control to the user over what they want to he hear and the levels of them is very important. Um, and 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 even um, like. I, I've in my in my years as as a audio designer and director, I've I've seen it all. I've seen games where the uh, the audio director says nobody's going to touch my mix of my uh, sound in my game because I've got it perfect exactly how um how it needs to be. To the other end of that is giving control to everything. You know, I want to. Um, I remember back in the day on Need for Speed, I was asked to put in. Um, volume controls for the skid sounds and uh, the um, separate from other tire sounds, uh, separate from the music, separate from collision sounds, and and you know as a director and designer, I'm like, but people are gonna mess with my mix and it's not gonna sound good. But we all getting back to my my what I was talking about, we all hear things the world differently. And we, our ears maybe don't, um, aren't able to um, filter through the clutter, like Brandon was, was just saying, but some people love that. And uh, so I think that's, that's an important aspect here is giving the user control over their, their own listening experience. In, in lieu of, of having that though, what's interesting, cause like, like, the the apps that I sound designed for like I wish we had those controls like I wish someone had written those accessibility product requirements in place and so my experience though mostly has been like creating one mix that just kind of works which I think is 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 others experience too most others and I think you know I think there are like rules of thumb so people may favor clutter but I don't think anyone favors sounds that would overlap and then not be individually discernible from each other. That it, eventually it becomes impossible for the brain to, to parse out differences. So you generally want to work at different work with different frequencies. I don't want to bring music into it, but I guess I will. Uh, Cause I, I feel like music is a great example because um, in music, if you're creating music that's considered to be consonant music, your 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 distribution of notes and frequencies is is typically more spread out, and that allows you to hear them better individually. Um, and so that's like an approach I've taken for like more tonal sound this UI sound design is that very approach and like thinking of like the worst case scenario, like what if ten sounds all play at once well hopefully you have some kind of ducking algorithm to lower the volume so you don't so you don't blast the user's ear or compression or compression um but ideally you make it so all of those sounds come across and all of them are are heard and so they need they would need different timbres um in addition to being different pitch territory they need to have a different timbre because otherwise two different sounds at different pitches with the same exact timbre might sound like one sound. So yeah, it is an example, like it with the Vuforia apps I was working on, we had like a notification reveal sound. We had a dialogue reveal sound, a button click sound. Um, it was possible to have five sounds happen at once. So what I would do, like when I was sound designing was I'd record the app and try to run it, like get it in chaotic situations, and make a video capture of it, and then work with like a, an audio editor, like Logic Audio, which is just like a multi-track editor and do my sound design, but then like see what would happen in these like situations where there was clutter and could it, could it be in the end, would that experience still come across? But uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, I can see how someone 
um, low vision or or blind would 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 favor a lot more sonic density, um, especially since that sense is so honed. In the same way that so someone using a a screen reader is going to do it typically faster than a seen person, um, certainly faster than I than I can read. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, I mean, I guess the point is is like to and there there's limitations to that, like how much sound you can hear. There's a study that talks about simultaneous um, auditory icon recognition, and it's up to six. Nobody went above six, um, but from personal experience, it can recognize around 20. Did, did they, did in that experience, did they try spatializing the sounds individually? Because I wonder if that Yes, and that increases the recognizability is, is by is spatializing it a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Interesting. You know, R Robert had mentioned haptics and it's something that when we were kind of planning out this talk that we had discussed and something that I, I've, I worked on in the past, um, I, I designed the haptic patterns for the Magic Leap One controller. So if you've used the Magic Leap and you felt like the the like the rumble of like hovering something or or starting up the controller, well, actually someone else did the starting up, but I but I worked really closely on most of those patterns. And that's kind of another way to get in a nut like to add like another layer of polyphony. Like if you want, if you want to imply even more, you can target a different sense. Um, now with haptics, it's it's hard that you can have haptics in stereo, and we've seen with like the Switch controller, we've seen some amazing games where you, I mean, where you basically can roll the the controllers around, and and you have the sensation of with two haptics, one in each controller, you have the sensation of a ball rolling across um, in your in your brain imagines that it's weighted because the haptic sensation is so real. But I think that the simultaneous haptic pattern limitation is even more limited than ears. Um, but you can, but then I guess with haptic suits, you have that ability to pinpoint sounds all over the user's body. At some point though, it's probably just noise as well. Yeah, I think that's right. The um, I love the idea of uh, in, in the future looking at um, spatial haptics, right? Being able to have uh, enough um, actuators, and you, you don't need a whole lot to give some sense of positionality. Is it you know, ahead of me? Is it behind me? Movement from left to right, um, back to front, the, those, those kinds of things. Um, what, one thing that I'd, I, I thought I'd um, touch on going back to the Simultane simultaneity of, of sounds and, and mixing is that um, I think we can take some learnings from what we do in games and you know all, all of these platforms that we have have some sort of audio engine uh, under the under the hood and most if not all have priority systems most if not all have the ability to do say ducking or other things and you can do um, use priority priority systems to um, focus what's most important at any given uh, given moment, um, and you can also do things like this is kind of rare, but I think it's something that we've talked about in gaming to um, use um, EQs to carve out space for for sounds. So for example, in a racing game, you have engine sounds, they cover the complete um, band up from low to high in, in frequency. They're just walls of noise uh, in a way. If you want a sound to cut through that, you kind of have to carve out uh, space in, in the frequencies for that. And we, we have the technologies to do that um, today. It's a, it takes a little bit of, of work and it takes CPU uh, to do it, but those that's a great technique um, for keeping your volumes of your um, your broad band sounds, but also being able to hear other things, even if it's just like, you know, you can carve out for voice, you could carve out for ear cons, um, you can, and when you, if you're just carving out a little bit of space, 
your brain for that engine is still filling that in, but now I can also hear that other additional piece. Um, and then you add in all these other things that supplement with haptic, supplement with ry uh, rhythmic patterns using musical cues. Um, it's, um, it allows us, I think, to pull in even more information all simultaneously. So why, <laughs> oh, go ahead. Oh no, that was a tangential topic, but based on what Brandon was asking in the chat about what audio cues we need or ear cons to make a mainstream VR platform accessible. I was sort of, that led me down the road of thinking, we've talked a bunch about sort of these in-game or in-app audio experiences we create, but I wonder if there's any benefit or value in having consistent sounds, which people get used to, to mean something across apps, across platforms, and how that sort of fits with some future version of a VR screen reader. I think that's sort of a fascinating topic prompted by Brandon. Well, I think once one platform does it, other platforms will, you know, kind of monkey see, monkey do. That's what happened in audio games, and that's what happens in, you know, mainstream games. And I'm sure that's what happens in visual VR right now, um, especially, you know, with visuals and whatnot. But, you know, kind of fundamentally speaking, I, I think the most important piece is like collision information, like when you hit a wall or an object, you know, having that information telling you that you're actually walking like footstep sounds of your own character um, and, you know, of other characters around you. I think those are really, really, really critical pieces. And then having some sort of text, uh, you know, being able to interface with a, like a normal screen reader, like sending messages about the names of different objects around you and having some sort of scan. I think like those are like the most important pieces of interacting with any VR environment. None of the VR platforms have that yet um, that are mainstream. I think a challenge with the games that I played is the discoverability. You almost need to learn a whole audio language before you can be proficient in many of them, in the more complex ones. So, you know, sort of, A, how do you avoid that? But I think there's something interesting about there's going to be audio from the platform and audio from the experience, e.g. game, and you know, do they have to fit together? How do they fit together? And, you know, is the game creator controlling the full soundscape or is that also something coming from the sort of the platform stroke screen reader? And that's interesting because currently games have, you know, really rich, well-designed audio. And you really want anything else that's assistive to slot right into that. Yeah, you know, I wonder if, if um, like being a, a long time game audio designer um, and being very precious about my, the various games and the soundscapes that we, we create, um, I would be more leaning towards, uh, I want the sounds to, um, fit into my 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 universe, but there's 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 different aspects getting uh, of um, that we've been talking about. There's the the the, the sound frequency and and the, the the tonal qualities of it. Um, maybe that's the portion that I want to be uh, that, to make it fit more into my game world. But if there's consistency across um, platforms with, say, the musical aspects, the rhythmic aspects, uh, I just sort of thrown the idea out. It's you could almost get a, a a consistent set of patterns that then you can modify for your for your world, for your your virtual experience, for your game, whatever it might be. Um, I don't know. I, I, it's a uh, it's an interesting question. I, don't... I think if anybody, you know, I just don't think we don't, we don't have enough data yet to say what, what that kind of, you know, constantness between the platforms, what the most efficient one would be. So I guess we just choose one and go with it. Yeah. And I guess there's a sort of this interesting idea of 
when in the work we're doing um, in seeing AI and then also in Soundscape, Microsoft Soundscape, is this idea that you control the full audio experience. Okay, you don't control the real world, but as far as the soundscape being played, you have final control over that. But that's also true of the virtual world experience. And then you would basically need to slot two totally potentially separate audio experiences together, the assistive and the designed, let's say. I see Andy has his hand up for a while here. Andy? Hey, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm Andy Slater. I'm a sound designer and um, accessibility lead at uh, Fair Worlds, and I'm also blind. And so I really love this discussion of, you know, thinking of it as a sound designer and then also from, you know, the accessibility standpoint. And one thing that I've come across, um, this, especially with a, this is a site specific, um, like walking tour app that we're doing at work that's specific to the, um, the Seattle Center. Um, we've tried to, or, or we've, we've created our own backdoor way in unity of creating something like soundscape, but I really would love to know if there's a way that in these sort of apps or different programs or whatever, if we can implement soundscape into the app, because it seems like, um, you know, building our own is, is fun and, and cool, but it also kind of, I, I kind of want this sort of standardized things for thing for those who use the app to be very, you know, comfortable to, you know, to just have it integrated in, you know what I mean? Like, it, it seems like it would be great to have access to seeing AI or soundscape for those sort of situations. Is that possible? We should definitely talk and I can also put you in touch with my colleague who runs soundscape team. So Definitely, we'll share our contact details and do reach out. We can see what's possible. Love Thank to hear more about your work. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I think anything that that we have here that we can add to, for example, our our XR Access uh, and XRA GitHub. Um, I'll put a link to that in the chat. But you know, we're we're trying to to get open source examples of code um, of systems and things like this that can, yeah, make it easier to not have to build all of these accessibility tools in from scratch, because that is going to be a wall that is too high for a lot of developers to climb. Um, but the more we can reduce that workload for people to make their stuff accessible, the more accessible apps we'll see. So anything that, that folks um, think we can contribute to that, uh, please, you know, reach out or, or fill out the form in that, because um, we we want to not have to reinvent the the wheel every time, right? I'm sure nobody here wants to do that. Um, one one question that I, I'd love to uh, get the the wisdom from folks here, um, and also I, I encourage folks that have been on mute to to speak up as well. Um, when it comes to to passive versus active sound, I think we've been talking a lot about people, you know, hearing what's around them as this just kind of constant passive thing or maybe in response to, to certain types of interactions or placing a beacon. Um, I'm curious if there's been consideration of something like a, a sonar, right? Something where uh, people can put out sound or hit up some button and, and get a specific burst of sound that can inform them about things. Because I know that's something that, that in real life people can train themselves to do. Um, and I'd, I'd love to to have some conversation around what does it look like when people aren't just passively receiving sound from their environment, but actively using sound to, to scope out their environment. This is Jesse here. I, is it okay if I unmute? Yeah. And then after that, we'll have uh, Aaron just put his hand up here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> really, I mean, I, I guess I could speak a tiny bit to what you would just ask, but I had a couple other just quick uh, thoughts. But um, I know like there's a lot of audio games out there that do have sort of like an audio kind of a pinging uh, feature where you can kind of like, you know, what is nearby me and you can kind of, you know, hit a sound and then you hear little uh, almost like ear cons of like what is around you. And as far as a mainstream goes, I really, really like the last of us one and two where you can have their pinging system. Basically you hold down the right bumper and then if you hit um, 
what is it like square for enemies and circle for objects you can kind of see like okay i want to know you know what kind of people are around or you know enemies around me or i want to know what kind of objects maybe they could be interactables or they could be um, items that you can pick up consumables but those are a couple of really good examples i love the way that last of us actually does that uh, in a gameplay context but one thing that, that on the last topic that we were that you guys were talking about is i would love to see some kind of consistency i'm a legally blind uh, technology user, gamer, uh, VR user myself. And I've been trying to work with this for a, quite a while. And like, you know, every game can definitely have its, or every experience could have its own sounds, but I would love to see, again, not having to reinvent the wheel every time, but even something cross platform, you know, because so many of the experiences might be on PC, it might be on console, uh, it might be on mobile. And one of the things that I just kind of recently experienced, I did put it in the chat was that <laughs> there are some games that, that, you know, on the consoles, they don't necessarily support some accessibility features because the platforms themselves don't have those accessibility features. But even on a platform where you know I'm still in the Steam um, environment, there are games that have accessibility features like narration or text to speech that I can play on my PC and they have the accessibility features. But hmm, when I try to play them, I try to load them on my Steam Deck, <laughs> that has no accessibility features whatsoever. So technically, the game will run, but you just won't get any of those um, accessibility features in there. So I would love to see more things like actual, and I know they're sort of working on it, but like on an engine level, so whether it's Unreal, Unity, CryEngine, you know, whatever it happens to be, um, I think it's really important because then again, you have to re jigger everything for every platform. Um, and it is sort of frustrating. Um, that's one area where I think consistency would be really, really helpful. Awesome, thank you, Jesse. Um, Aaron? Yeah, so um, so I've been doing, uh, since I started my PhD, uh, my research is focused on uh, accessibility for VR, uh, specifically looking at uh, no uh, visuals at all. So how do you navigate an environment with that? Uh, we originally looked at sonar for as a technique for uh, exploring the environment. Um, and so sonar is uh, an interesting way of doing it. And it did work well in a nice slow paced uh, environment where you're just kind of taking your time, nothing uh, overly, uh, you know, you're not rushed. Uh, and sonar, uh, our uh, participants found that uh, sonar needs to cycle so you need to be sending out a ping uh, around you can't send out that burst we tried a, a just a full 360 burst and then having it ping whatever uh, it hit uh, that full burst became too much audio noise to be able to pick out where anything was really in the environment you were just like there's everything here and i have no idea um, whereas that rotating ping and you can the speed of it doesn't need to be slow. You don't have to be you know, just barely going. It can be rapidly going around, but just pausing for a moment to throw out that ping here, ping here, ping there, uh, worked really well. Um, as we started, this kind of ties to some of the previous conversations. As we started exploring more fast paced um, experiences with no visuals, so we developed a, a racing game that you actually are driving around a track at 100 miles an hour uh, with no visual input. Um, the audio uh, was a little helpful, but it was only really helpful in those. It's just something to let me know what's going around around. You know, it could be the, the music in the background, the car, sound of the vehicles, but anything that needed an instantaneous uh, response to it, words were just too slow. Uh, and and even more like longer sounds and stuff like that became uh, too slow. So we actually uh, for that had a switch to um, 
uh, haptic uh, feedback to be able to really provide that instantaneous uh, reaction time. So it those environments that you're trying to do, it really depends upon what the goal is. Is it just a laid back explore museum type thing? You have a lot more leeway uh, with what you're using. If you're trying to do something that's fast paced, you're a lot more limited on, okay, uh, what can I do to get someone to respond uh, immediately? So. I think it's a really good point uh, to that Aaron's making here is that um, different experiences are going to require different um, different tools, right? A racing game versus um, an RPG uh, or an exploratory um, virtual experience um, versus you know no a first person shooter um, and like I I think. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is a number of years ago, um, there is a, so there's a, a gamer who's blind, his, his moniker is uh, Sightless Combat. You may uh, know that name. Um, and the uh, publishing group was working on um, Killer Instinct, the fighting game, I worked directly with him um, on this. I watched Sightless Combat come in and beat the crap out of people who <laughs> who could see the screen and and have the the uh, full sensory experience for it and he was really good and so the reason i mentioned that is a lot of the work that went into that game um, had to do with the design of the sounds themselves every character and every move had very distinct sound designed to them. And then we also go back to the um, that conversation that we had about um, different mixes and, and control over different parts of, of the sound. Uh, that was super important. So he would um, set up a very specific mix for, for himself. And it was amazing to, uh, to watch. Um, and that's a fast paced uh, game. And at the time, there was no spatial sound. Uh, you had in spatial in, in that kind of a game where it's just sort of a, um, a, a 2D space um, is, wasn't necessarily um, uh, needed, uh, but panning certainly was. Uh, so I think it's a really good point. A lot of this stuff is going to be bespoke to the experiences. Um, I. I also, I've been looking at, at a lot of um, audio accessibility technologies, whether it's for blind and low vision gamers or for deaf and hard of hearing. And one of the core tenets to what we are thinking about and doing is that we need to be targeting sets of tools for engines and middleware that make it easy for developers to do this because if they, they don't have those tools. Um, they're just it's not going to be put in it's um, accessibility, let alone audio is not going to be a priority for uh, a team that's trying to get out um, a, a VR experience or, or a platform uh, or a console game. What so types these, of tools do you think would be most effective? Plug in models for doing these things. Um, even a, a Good screen reader for uh, for every uh, engine, and I know UI becomes a is bespoke to a lot of games, but um, just simple mechanisms in the uh, in the game engines that are used today, whether that's Unreal or Unity, uh, audio middleware such as um, Audio Kinetics Wise, Firelight's FMod Studio. We can we can create these these plugins that I think if um, you create a set of plugins and or scripts that are sort of a baseline right and so if you have an indie developer that doesn't have the time to do anything um, unique for their game it will just work for their game but 
it should also be flexible enough such that these these tools can be expanded upon, like act as a shim between the engine and what they want to do in their their game, so they can do truly um, bespoke uh, implementations of of, of them. Um, and those things, so they just don't exist yet. There are some, um, I think, uh, Unreal has been, um, has a screen reader, but if you're doing any um, uh, of your own UI, um, you have to kind of build it from scratch. Um, well, I know that um, uh, most audio games nowadays interface directly with the user's screen reader, uh, and there's a ton of tools to uh, do that, uh, like Toke, uh, I think, is a cross-platform interface for that. Um, web uh, Anything in the web, you just use ARIA Live Regions and yeah. it interface it with the screen reader. Um, and so I know that a lot of blind people like to use their own screen reader whenever possible. Yeah, well, and then we also talk about, uh, and Andy, I, I see your hand up, I'll, I'll make this quick. Um, for example, I worked with the Minecraft team. Um, they put in a, a text-to-speech system for their, their menu and UI, but they had to cover 20 some odd um, different platforms to, to run on. Uh, so there's there's also, Yes, we have these tools, but if they're not on all, I think somebody mentioned this, uh, if it's not consistent and not on all platforms, you're going to have, um, you're still going to have work that has to be done on those that don't support uh, them. So uh, it's, it becomes harder, especially for those that are doing lots of cross-platform. Um, Andy? Oh, sorry, Hi, thank you. Um, I hope this isn't too off topic, but we were talking about audio kinetic and middleware and stuff. How do we get to those companies to make it so that blind creators can actually use those, um, the middleware and that sort of thing? None of it's accessible and it's kind of, you know, keeping blind people from really crafting the sound and implementing it into these programs where, you know, this discussion today um, really shows that, you know, our input is just as important, if not more than anybody else's. And um, unfortunately, we still have to work with like sighted people to get all of that done. So that's more of a statement, I think, than a question. But if anybody knows anybody at Audio Kinetic or, um, you know, FMOD or anything like that, um, I think it would be great if you could put that in their ear. I raised my hand to that, Andy. I think that's a fantastic point. You're absolutely right. Um, uh, I have lots of contacts at, at Audio Kinetic. Uh, it's, and tooling in general um, doesn't get very good grades uh, when it comes to accessibility. Um, because again, when we're building tools for whether it's games or VR or whatever, uh, we tend to see that uh, the minimum is put in. There's compliance rules and that's about what, what we get. Uh, out of out of these tools, but I don't think um, Wise is even compliant uh, from that perspective. I think the only platform that's possibly maybe kind of sort of compliant is Godot for building games, and mm. that's questionable because um, it's open source <laughs> enough for blind people to go in and hack on it. Uh, places like Unity and Unreal Engine just don't have enough openness for blind people to go in and make the accessibility modifications themselves so it that's the that's a that's a big problem too so um i wonder if there's some way for you know companies like you know some way for companies like unity to feel comfortable for blind hackers to come in and build their own interfaces um because they don't have the resources or the will to want to do it yeah i wanted to just um shift to like a slightly different topic and kind of um answer something too, where Dylan had brought up uh, active sound. So another use case for sound is giving a, a user a voice, like an accessible use case. So um, at Cognition One, I, I mentioned the work we're doing with um, users with cerebral palsy. And so we're working on um, a user interface that um, basically relies on head pose where a user uses their head to target on different keys on a keyboard and through various dwell mechanisms, they're able to type and communicate. 
And so what's interesting with that is there, um, there are sound cues in the experience to let the user know as well as haptics when they're typing and inputting text. But then the end result of that is the audio as well as the visual, like the string that a user is trying to communicate is, is actually projected out the front of the display. Um, and what's interesting, um, so you hear, you hear the voice, you hear what the user is trying to say. They could be talking to a caretaker or communicating with someone across the room, and then you, you see it. And I think there's like a lot of opportunity there um, from not only like from personalizing a voice, but um, I think Larry brought up the term, uh, <laughs> I'm going to forget the term already, but uh, half emoji or audio emoji, yeah, like audio emoji example would be like um, the ability to speak. And then also, in addition to having some customization of your voice, uh, you like using audio emojis, ear cons, perhaps of your creation, even in conjunction with that speech. So uh, it's just, it's just another use case for, for sound. And I think the spatial, the spatialization is a given right now, instead of emulating spatial sound in a um, augmented environment, there's a, there's a point source for sound in a physical environment. And it's just a reminder how, how well that works in, in terms of understanding the sound source. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Well, I'm afraid we are at time, um, but I want to encourage uh, everybody who, who was a part of this conversation, if you want to keep um, keep this this going, because we've been really loving to see uh, just the, the brainwaves getting shared here. Um, I'm going to put in the Slack, uh, the, um, the chat here, the link to the XR Access Slack. Um, we have a community of people who are working on these problems. Um, group in our ADXR team, especially is working on 3D content captions. And I think a lot of this discussion will be really relevant there. Um, so I'll put in there and I wanna just thank everybody for coming, thank our speakers uh, for, for contributing their expertise. Um, and uh, yeah, this was fantastic. I'm hoping we'll be able to take all of the, the insights we captured here and um, really turn that into some, some best practices because uh, y'all have the the skills to pay the bills here. Um, yeah, I think with that, uh, we'll we'll end today's session. But thank you very much, everyone, and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks for it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.